Digital transformation is a buzzword that's fun to say, but hard to grasp. As more and more organizations embark on these technological journeys, are they really being led by the proper steward? Rich Penkowski is the CEO of Markets for Deloitte Consulting, and he believes that in order for companies to have a smooth transition, you have to think of it as a process that involves two key members of the C-suite. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Rich discusses why the CIO and CFO need to play an important role in any digital journey, and how the relationship between those roles continues to evolve. Plus, he digs into the acceleration of the digital agenda brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Enjoy this episode. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. This podcast is created by the team at mission.org. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I'm Ian Faison, host of IT Visionaries. And today we have special guest, Rich, what's going on? Ian, how are you? It's great to be here today. Great to have you on the show. Uh, We have a really exciting discussion today, uh, very topical for everything that is is going on in the world. And uh, we're going to be talking about accelerating CIO's agenda, you know, the cool stuff that's going on at, at Deloitte and, uh, and all of your conversations with CIOs and CFOs and CTOs that are uh, driving a lot of really important work here in, uh, in this day and age. So let's get into it. First, how did you get started uh, in technology? You know, Ian, it's, it's actually sort of funny. Um, so when I, when I went to school uh, at the State University of New York at Albany up in uh, New York State, I was actually a, a very focused economics major. I just loved the notion of mathematics and business. And, you know, that was going to be my, felt like that was my passion. And you had to take this one class, it was like an introduction to business technology. And, and you know, mind you, this was the late 80s, right? So that was a very cutting edge type of, uh, type of class. And you know, I got into that class and I was totally hooked, right? Like I, just this whole notion of using, you know, kind of different kinds of computer technology and, you know, kind of all of the emerging technologies that were happening in the 80s, you know, it really caught my attention. And, and, you know, this was stuff like basic simulation and critical path networks and, you know, COBOL programming. And uh, the school had just launched an MIS degree and I switched my major and we were off to the races. And, you know, my first job after college was actually in computer programming. And, I was fortunate enough to work with what was then uh, cutting edge technologies like DB2 and uh, CICS. And, uh, you know, and I just never left the world since. And it's been an exciting ride over the last 25 years or so. So flash forward to today. Tell us a little bit more about what it means to be the CEO of Markets for Deloitte Consulting. Yeah. So, um, you know, within the role that I have um, as our deputy CEO, I really am focused all around ensuring that we bring the right industry depth to the solutions that we help de- devise and provide to our clients, right? And so, so if you kind of think about it, you know, we, we practice across a whole host of industries. And one of the things our clients count on is to make sure that we're bringing your very industry-specific insights into the business problem they're trying to solve and make sure that we, you know, kind of tailored a, a, a solution that's right for them. You know, what's really interesting about that role, Ian, currently is that we're seeing such a convergence of different things happening across industries that, uh, you know, we've, I've really been focusing a lot of my efforts with my team on, you know, how do we really figure out where there are common business issues across industries where we can bring some best practices, you know, from around our, our, our group as opposed to any one industry. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting time to be there. And then, um, you know, I individually really spent the majority of my time individually practicing at the intersections of tech and finance. And so, uh, as you can imagine, that kind of background is, is pretty relevant and, and it's pretty interesting that in, this, in this day and age. Yeah. And I think, you know, you said it, that tech and finance are, you know, tied together at the hip. So, can you share a little bit about this, like the CIO and the, the CFO relationship? You know, you, you've spoken about this a ton and, uh, and written about it. Where are we at right now? Because it seems like 
the relationship has changed significantly since, you know, since COVID and, and the pandemic started, perhaps, or maybe not. Yeah, you know, look, it's sort of fascinating. I think if you look at the CFO and CIO relationship, it has been examined and explored and analyzed for, you know, I think as long as I've been in this arena. And and because the dynamic's incredibly important, right? I mean, there are times when the collaboration of those two executives are absolutely crucial for success. And there's also times where the natural tension between a CFO's stewardship responsibilities for the enterprise and a CIO's desire to, you know, kind of drive innovation and accelerate strategy through technology, you know, naturally come at odds. And, you know, the best relationships I've seen is is when those two individuals can move and, and kind of morph between those two dimensions of their relationship. Now, there's a lot of interesting things happening right now at the epicenter of that relationship. And I'll give you two kind of interesting examples, right? You know, the, the first one is just around, you know, looking at digital transformation that, you know, almost every organization, or really every organization is grappling with at some point today. Two unique things going on. Uh, the first one is that the traditional ways that CFOs have tried to assess and manage ROI for those investments actually fly in the face of what the best and most innovative CIOs are doing around driving agile methodology into their organization for purposes of system design and deployment. If you think about it, one, you know, is typical waterfall. ROI loves that, works perfectly in finance, doesn't work well at all when you're trying to innovate and put minimal viable products into production as quickly as possible. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of organizations now where the CFO is really coming to the table and working with the CIO to think about creative ways to measure ROI, to not get in the way of deploying agile methods throughout the organization, but to actually complement it. The second one is just around access to capital. So, you know, no surprise in the COVID-19 era that we find ourselves in, the pace of digital transformation is having to accelerate. That is putting a tremendous burden on access to capital and how best to deploy limited and sometimes shrinking capital to very necessary IT investments. And so, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of CFOs and CIOs, you know, talking about how to identify new sources of capital. And, and by the way, so some of the more interesting things we're seeing is where CFOs are becoming much more comfortable when CIOs are introducing things like an ecosystem where perhaps there can be a co-investment between a you know, hyperscaler in the cloud environment and a systems integrator and maybe even academic institution to co-fund innovation. And, and we see that um, you know, in spades right now in the life sciences sector, where uh, the whole idea around how to accelerate clinical trials around these vaccines is, is watching these ecosystems emerge, this co-funding emerge. And I think that model and that archetype are going to become very prevalent, um, you know, not only more broadly in healthcare, but really across all industries. So you know, there's just two kind of interesting examples of where we're seeing some different um, collaboration. But yeah, the collaboration is certainly accelerating. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And I think that a lot of CIOs, you know, took this opportunity to say, hey, we were at this quote unquote step in our journey, our digital, you know, transformation, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, we needed to be here. Clearly, we weren't ready for this, or maybe we were ready for this. But in order to, you know, have a better employee experience to do these things, like we need to accelerate this transformation. We need to s- accelerate this digital agenda. What are you seeing from uh, from your end on like best practices of ways that CIOs are are accelerating that journey? Yeah, um, you know, I think there's a couple of interesting things that we are seeing, and one of those is, I think obviously when everybody had to make a very abrupt shift to deal with a broader segment of their workforce working from home, that drove a lot of IT-oriented investment. And it was in areas that you would, of course, you know, expect. Uh, how do I deal with the infrastructure? How do I deal with the scaling associated with having a remote workforce? You know, where do I need to standardize on infrastructure? How do I deal with cybersecurity? I mean, the stuff that you would expect 
you would have to do with a remote workforce. What I find really interesting is that right now, um, we are seeing many of our clients evaluating what they're doing with their workforce and determining how they could take some of the lessons they're learning and apply it to their interaction with their customer. I mean, and if you think about just, you know, the human engagement side of dealing with a virtual workforce, right? You know, you've got to think about how you're going to engage them and kind of keep them motivated, how you are going to maintain an organizational culture, how you're going to worry about their well-being. And, you know, obviously a CHRO is going to be very involved with that, but the CIO is actually got a very equal seat at the table thinking about the various ways that technology can play. Well, those same dimensions, right, the culture you want to create and you want to portray with your customer, the way you want to think about your customer's well-being, right, if you're a, if you're a good, you know, strong enterprise and a responsible enterprise, you know, the techniques being used to you know, kind of interact with your employees are now being ported over to, uh, to customer experience, right? And, you know, we, we see that, you know, as a great example in the financial services sector where, you know, you, you've got, you know, particularly in the investment management space where you've got individuals who are worried, you know, about their customers and their anxiety in this difficult financial environment. And, you know, they're starting to rely on the same interactive technologies to interact with their customer as organizations are using to interact with their employees. And so I think you're going to see a lot of the lessons learned coming from the human engagement side of the equation start to manifest itself more broadly, you know, not only in the, in the private sector, Ian, but I think in the public sector as well, right? As, you know, governmental entities begin to think about, you know, how to maintain and improve their collaboration with their constituents. Yeah, well, let me tell you, I, uh, I was just at the DMV and uh, you really feel the stretch of those government entities in this exact moment, right? Because now all of a sudden they have to have a digital agenda. They have to have a digital first mindset. This is random, but I just applied for a, a library card because I didn't, I don't know the last <laughs> time I had a library card, but that it was, you know, me signing up through a digital portal and then getting an email and then being told to forward that email to another email address. Right. Like, and so, you know, like those sort of things were like in the government sector, like it's pretty unacceptable that we have that level of like, you know, digital awareness, but kind of here we are. And this was a huge catalyst to say, like, we clearly need digital infrastructure changes across the board for a lot of these. And, uh, and now here's the proof, you know, we know what the future looks like for digital first everything. And, uh, and we're definitely not there. No, right. And, and look, I, I think, you know, that we, we, will, we will continue to see an acceleration of the public-private partnerships as these technologies become more ubiquitous and as the expectations begin to rise. And you know, I, for one, applaud that. I, I think that is, you know, that, that's a great recipe for success and it helps lift society as a whole. So, so let's hope we see more of that. So how have you seen IT change, you know, throughout the years of your career? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's funny, right? I mean, IT's changed immensely. You know, if I had to offer up a few broad themes, you know, I, I might summarize them something like this, right? You know, clearly the acceleration of the digital agenda, as we talked about earlier, you know, we were starting to see it accelerate. It, it is really accelerating now. And, um, you know, I think that's going to be, that's both exciting and daunting for organizations. They're going to have to, you know, think long and hard about that. You know, the second thing that I would say is pretty significant here is just how the ubiquity of consumer technology has fundamentally changed the role of an IT professional. You know, I, I had a client that I served um, several years ago, and we were putting in a, a financial system for him. And he made a statement to me, I'll never forget it. He goes, Rich, you know, I want this system to be Apple easy and Google fast, was kind of the way he framed it. And, you know, at the time, that was a real challenge, right? Like, yeah. how are you never hit this expectation? Today, that's table stakes for an IT professional, right? Their employee base, their customer base, everybody is used to Apple Easy, Google Fast. And so, you know, they're having to think about the way they perform work and the solutions they provide through that mindset, which I think is, is pretty interesting. The third one I would just say is that, you know, watching the evolution of an IT professional where 
Today's best IT staff tend to be much broader and are able to move across technologies more seamlessly. Whereas, you know, even five years ago, hyper specialization of IT skills was crucial. And so I think that puts a pretty significant burden on, you know, an, an IT professional to continue to develop. And more importantly, I think it puts a heavy responsibility on a CIO to think about the operating model that he or she needs to adopt in order to ensure that they are providing their team with the opportunity to grow and to be fungible across the enterprise. So, you know, I kind of like, I think those are sort of the the big things that that we're seeing. And, and, you know, if I had to say kind of one more, I, I would say the other thing I personally find both rewarding and interesting is that the level of what I'll call tech savvy in the C-suite of today's organization is at an all-time high. There are CEOs that I talk to that are, you know, very conversant in technology. There are boards that I address who are thoughtful about technology. And, you know, I think if you look back seven, 10 years ago, um, you would not find that at all, that everything to do with technology sat in the CIO's office only. And today it's everywhere, which, you know, again, I think is is a great opportunity, but you know, it, it raises the game or the table stakes for the CIO as well. So I know that as a deputy CEO, you got to protect those folks and just give them a little bit of love here, but <laughs> you're sure that they're all that tech savvy? I'm not here to judge one way or the other, but I, I'm a little surprised to hear you say that folks are like that. And the reason why I say it is not to be, uh, not to be snooty, is that so much of what happens for an executive now is just on your phone. So it's like there's so much that's different than, uh, you know, it's just a different type of tech usage. I mean, the number of, you know, executives that I talk to that, you know, pretty much just use their phone for work at this point that like rarely even open up the laptop, I mean, is pretty astonishing. So that's why I, I I mean, I kid a little bit, but I, I am curious to see like, to hear you say that because there's certain brands of boards, like for example, like understanding MarTech or something like that, that we've, we've heard is a little bit, you know, less robust, but, but I'm curious to, to hear you say that, that you think that those folks are, are, are increasing their digital savvy. Oh yeah. No, look, I, look, I mean, I, th- I think it's a fair challenge, but, but I will tell you now, Can they explain to you how to implement the exact technology for the problem that they want to solve? Yeah, no, right? That's still the domain of the CIO and and the architecture that an organization wants to go and design and execute to advance their business strategy, you know, CIO, CTO. However, when, you know, we're talking to organizations about something, you know, as basic as optimizing a supply chain, you would be astonished at sort of the level of just intrinsic understanding the C-suite has about the way analytics that can be used or the way machine learning, you know, asking questions about, you know, is this an opportunity to, to apply AI or machine learning? Now, they may not know the, the, the how, but they know what's possible. And, you know, when you think about, you know, the kind of the phrase tech savvy, right, it's the ability to say, like, I know there's a technology that's possible and applicable to this business problem. And then they'll turn to the CIO and say, you know, how do I get there? But we see that, you know, all the time. Yeah, I I was, you know, with the board of a consumer company here, uh, you know, just a month or so ago. And, you know, they were looking at, you know, kind of a a digital transformation in one of their business units. And it was was interesting because when you looked across the boardroom, there were two former CIOs on the board, right, from, from other organizations. And, you know, their, their audit committee chair was from a high tech company. And so their, their boardroom was tech savvy, which again, I, I don't think we saw, you know, years ago, but it's becoming increasingly relevant today. And, and look, I think those organizations that are not thinking about that are going to find themselves, you know, in an enormous game of catch up, which, you know, in an environment where change is as rapid as it is, um, that becomes a very dangerous place to be. Well, you know, I mean, I I always think to the stories of uh, you know the CIO bringing in, hey, this is this is the you know the seven year you know digital transformation plan, yeah. <laughs> and the CEO asking them to print out the slides so that they can look at them, right? Like that's kind of the the old joke, which is which was not always such a joke, 
But what I think has fundamentally changed is like, especially when you look at like employee experience and the employee being the CEO or the board members, you know, being employees or or having a employee experience that is becoming more and more similar to uh, just like any employee, especially now with shelter in place, that you immediately saw that every single executive was now, you know, using a laptop for getting hopping on Zooms or they were, uh, you know, they have either an iPhone or, or whatever type of phone that they're, that they're going to be using for X, Y, and Z. And so you kind of have this like proliferation of, of like all of the consumer tech that had to be like immediate adoption. You know, it's funny, a- anecdotally doing this podcast, pre-COVID, we always had a lot of, and not just this podcast, but others, you know, executives that just like weren't super comfortable with doing like remote interviews. Now it's like, everybody's familiar with it, right? So you kind of have this proving ground a little bit where they understand the consumer tech. But the other side of that, like you mentioned, is the deeper tech, the AI, machine learning use cases, those sort of things that really drive those business outcomes. Like as, as you're talking to, you know, to, to CIOs who are earning that quote unquote seat at the table that we always talk about and are bringing, you know, business use cases to the CFO to the board, how are those conversations changing? You know, I, I think the probably the biggest shift that we see is the ability, you know, because of the nature of the technologies in use today, I think CIOs, you know, the one big advantage I've seen is the ability for a CFO or a CIO rather to, you know, kind of rapidly develop a proof of concept to demonstrate how the technology can be applied. I think one of the barriers we saw to technology adoption over the years is just this notion of, we're going to tell you what this solution should do. We're going to just describe how it might work. You're going to wait for 12 months, and then we're going to show you what you know phase one of the solution looked like. Totally. Which is not particularly compelling, right? If you're a CIO trying to get you know, multi-million dollar capital investment. You know, the ability now to say, you know, look, like, here's a business problem we're trying to solve. Like here's a here's a prototype of how it's going to look. This is the user interface. You can see it. Look, we've already mocked up, you know, kind of this particular scenario. You can kind of see how that works. You know, 90 days from now, we're going to address these three questions and get those into production, see how they work. And then the next four to five questions we're going to deal with are, you know, kind of in the next wave is a completely different dialogue, right? And, you know, those CIOs that yeah, like as mentioned earlier, have pushed for, you know, kind of more agile development, which, you know, as you know, is not an IT only discussion, right? That's a different way for the business to operate. It's a different way to engage with your users. Um, but the CIOs that are able to drive that, we have found are consistently able to actually offer solutions that are strategically on point, that merit the investment that they're asking for, and then get the outcome that the organization wants. And you know, that would be kind of, to me, the delta between the CIO who is, you know, kind of got the seat at the table and are being asked for their opinion on strategy from, you know, the CIO that might be charged more with making sure that the, the trains are running on time. You know, industries have been hit differently with, uh, with the pandemic. Obviously, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. What are some of the obstacles that you've seen from some of the different organizations that you work with on how they're able to get through this, to maintain focus, you know, to acknowledge what's going on and obviously, you know, take care of their employees and do those things, but try to figure out like, you know, what is the way forward? Yeah. You know, I mean, look, the, the, the one thing for sure is that there's a lot of obstacles and, you know, you can spend a lot of time fixated on the obstacle or, you know, you can spend a lot of time sort of driving through what you want the uh, what you want the solutions to be, right? You know, I I would say that um, probably a couple of things you know w- worth noting that you know again I think that we've seen work well. Um, you know, the first one is you know I think CIOs in particular need to understand that um, this is not something that they can drive by themselves. And you know, it's interesting. And one of the things we we are seeing is the CFO playing a lot bigger role in the decision making around you know what's going to happen in the organization when um than than we have ever before and i think there's some interesting there's some interesting reasons for that 
you know, the other thing I would say is that, you know, placing the human experience at the center of every technology investment, it has really, at least in our experience, been the biggest driver for organizations to move from evaluating how to deal with the challenges that we're facing to actually executing on them, right? And so, you know, kind of putting the solution in a frame for how will the end user experience it? How will this actually, you know, perhaps be able to use to cross the enterprise in different ways? You know, how it becomes part of the, you know, the overall fabric of the way we're going to operate IT, that tends to drive um, more action than analysis. And ultimately, that's really what, you know, the better CIOs are achieving today are, are moving their organizations to action. And, and look, in this environment, you're in a far better position to act and adjust than you are in kind of analyze and be perfect before you move. Because, you know, as you and I both know, with, with things moving that quickly, you know, the plan you laid out 90 days ago could, you know, functionally be obsolete 90 days from now. So, you know, I mean, I think that's kind of, that's how we've seen, um, we've seen things play out in, in the organizations that we serve. And I, I suspect we'll continue to see that going forward. Yeah, I really like that. I mean, I, I think that that is, uh, you know, I, we, we always talk about strategy and tactics and how a lot of executives, you know, so focus on, on kind of the strategy piece, kind of let the tactics, you know, their teams manage, manage the actual implementation or things like that. But, you know, what's so funny is with like, with employee experience, with customer experience, it's so personalized now. It's coming down. I mean, it's so tactical in nature how things happen. The actual mechanics that go into like onboarding a new employee when it's digital only or or any of those things that really walking through those journeys is is pretty critical. I mean, is this something that you were working on with with you CFOs and CIOs, you know, 10 years ago? Oh, no. I mean, you know, n- not at all, right? And then, you know, I'll give you another great example. You know, we, we, we're doing some interesting work right now, you know, in the whole area of effective computing, right? Which is, you know, which is, you know, kind of in layman's terms, like, you know, when you're driving your car and it senses that you're moving, you know, you're moving between lanes, it might tell you to go get a cup of coffee, right? Because it's sort of sensing, it's sensing human behavior and reacting. You know, a couple of years ago, we started to do a meaningful amount of work with this in the um, employee safety arena right, where you can begin to sort of monitor, you know, kind of various employee behaviors on the shop floor. And, you know, we could, you know, the organizations could slow and accelerate the production lines even based on, you know, kind of the overall, you know, sort of speed with which the workforce was moving to avoid industrial accidents, right? Well, fast forward today, and we've got a couple of uh, organizations we're talking to who want to figure out, are there ways to sense when my workforce is beginning to see their well-being suffer through, you know, kind of the duration of Zoom calls, as an example, or, you know, the amount of time that they're actually interacting with their computer, which you can track, and are there things we can do to sort of help them sort of establish balance? Because we know that this is going to be, you know, present for a sustained period of time, and we can't have our workforce naturally burn out. I mean, so, we weren't having those conversations even 24 months ago, um, you know, let, let alone today. And, and you know, you, you start to extrapolate those kinds of experiences and think about, you know, what could I do to actually emotionally engage with a customer now via technology based on what I learn? And boy, it gets pretty exciting pretty fast. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I, I think we're on the, the precipice of a, you know, a wave of innovation around technology that none of us could have foreseen. So if you had, uh, you know, Rich's best advice for a CIO that's, that's going to their CFO asking for more money, what, what, what would be your, uh, your strategy? What would be your approach? Huh, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have a single approach because, um, you know, obviously every organization is different. But, uh, but you know, I, I probably would say this, right? You know, most CIOs underestimate the influence they can have when they actually tie the technology investment they want to make to the business strategy that the organization is trying to achieve. And I, and I think oftentimes, you know, CIOs get very problem focused 
And, you know, they know, right, that they've, they're in the best position to understand how technology can drive the strategy. They don't just necessarily make that link explicit. So I encourage every CIO I work with, it's like, look, make the link explicit. Because when you do that, right, the likelihood of capital investment is higher. So that, that's number one. Number two is I would say that there is, there is capital in this universe that can be deployed outside organizational walls. Um, you know, and, I, and I referenced this earlier, Ian, you know, the whole notion of capitalizing on the ecosystem with which you operate is an essential part of how to think about technology today. Um, and that could be the way you interact with your suppliers, right? And doing some joint technology investment there. You know, it could be the way that you, you know, kind of interact with your external recruiters. I mean, there's a whole host of ways to do that. You know, there's no one right answer for an organization, but the CIO that brings that creative mindset to solving the investment question around technology is going to be more successful, even if they don't necessarily use it. The notion that they explored it fundamentally changes the dialogue between the CIO and the CEO, which I, you know, I, we've seen as being very essential. Maybe the third one, and maybe the final one, is that, you know, I referenced it earlier, but I'll underline it, is that there is no reason, and in fact, it's detrimental if CIOs try to do it alone. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we see consistently, and by the way, this has stand, stood the test of time is that visible executive engagement around the investment being made increases the likelihood of that investment achieving the outcome it was designed for. For sure, right? The data shows us that over and over and over again. And one of the most important parts of that executive engagement, both from IT and the business, is transparency. To explain exactly why the investment's being made and this is to the workforce, right? Like how it's going to work, how it's going to matter, and how you're going to take your workforce and team on the journey to utilize this new technology in better and more innovative ways. And so, I don't know, kind of a long-winded answer, but I think when you kind of really put those components together, I think you've got a pretty good recipe for success. You've talked about reskilling in the past and just the need for, for talent in, in IT. What are some of the things that you're thinking about or that you're seeing folks do that can close that gap a little bit? It's really important, and I'm glad you brought that up, right? So a um, couple of interesting things to think about, right? You know, you got organizations today that are putting an immense focus on uh, evaluating and deploying all these advanced technologies, but it is clear that they are not investing in their IT teams. And I'll give you a, a really interesting data point here. So we just finished our Global Human Capital Trends Report. And we found that only 17, 17% of respondents are actually making significant investments in reskilling their staff to support their strategies around AI, just that one, that one common dimension, right? So this is a real gap. So what do you do about it, right? And I think there's a couple of things here. You know, the first one is that, you know, if you're a CIO, you've really got to rethink and make sure that the operating model you've created for IT is tailored for the work that you want IT to do now. I can tell you, Ian, more, more often than not, you know, we see IT shops where you know, their structure has been in place for the last decade and the technologies and the expectations of IT have moved in you know, incredible ways. And, and you know, this really is a, this is, a, this is a level of risk, right? That the organization needs to, to, to deal with, but, but that one is absolutely key. The other you know, advice that I, I would offer on this dimension is that, you know, a lot of times we're asked to kind of assess IT organizations. And, and one of the most interesting things I've seen, you know, kind of individually is there are clients and organizations out there that actually look at IT as a source of leadership talent. I spoke to one CIO just last week. And, you know, what she's doing is she's actually working with the CHRO and the CEO to take their you know, next generation leaders and giving them a rotational assignment into and out of the IT organization so that they can actually spread IT oriented leaders across the organization. So they've been at it for about six months. Something fascinating happened. Their IT turnover dropped by over 15% 
And when they started to talk about this in their campus and in their experienced higher recruiting, they saw the number of applications and the quality of the applicant rise. Like fascinating, right? So, so I just, you know, I take a step back and go, wow, that's a great approach to actually build IT and, and broad business talent. And I think you got to take sort of all of these techniques, figure out what's right for your organization, what will fit culturally and make it work. But, but yeah, yeah, but there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, but on the flip side, a lot of opportunity to unlock. What about any trends that you've seen uh, or that you're seeing in the market that are particularly interesting? Let's see. Um, you know, I, I guess there's a few of those, right? You know, I think one is just that the, um, as we're watching organizations look at the implications of remote work, there is clearly a trend emerging that is talking about rethinking, you know, what the pool of talent should be and how you can help your internal talent balance their professional aspiration and personal goals. I think that's a really important trend. We expect to see that trend continue. And I think that um, there's a high likelihood that'll, that'll um, increase the diversity of the workforce, which is you know, going be, to be really positive. You know, s- second one, you know, I talked a little bit about effective computing. I, I continue to believe this is going to be sort of a, a future wave. And I think the opportunity to enhance productivity, uh, job satisfaction, and even profitability, I think there's an enormous opportunity there. And that trend is just beginning. Probably the last one I might cover, Ian, is just the the increased adoption of what I would characterize or I'll call responsible AI. We did a, another sort of survey on the state of AI in the enterprise, and, and we saw that I think it was like 61% of respondents believe that AI would substantially transform their industry in the next three years. And 95% of the respondents, staggering number, expressed concern about the ethical risks associated with AI. I thought, you know, A, it was great to see that people felt that the application of AI was going to change their business, because I think that's, a, that's an exciting area. And I was equally excited to see organizations, you know, kind of being responsible and leading with the values that will help them figure out how to integrate AI with their customer and employees in really productive and responsible ways. So those are probably the big three that I would see. I mean, obviously, there's a lot, there's a lot on the horizon, but, you know, there's a few to think about anyway. Okay, Rich, now it is time for our lightning round. As always, our lightning round is brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Go to salesforce.com slash platform to learn more. They're the best. We love Salesforce. Check them out. Lightning round questions. Rich, are you ready? I am ready, Ian. What hobby or habit have you picked up during shelter in place? So I have increased the amount of reading that I am doing, uh, the, the luxury, and I'm doing it with a physical book in my hand because uh, as a frequent traveler, the notion of carrying books uh, went out the window with the advent of the Kindle, but I am back to actually reading physical books and it is wonderful. Probably nice for your eyes too, to get a, some non-screen time. Oh, very much so. Although the book, the, the book I just finished was about the pandemic of 1918 which was both, you know, historically quite interesting, but also quite disturbing in today's day and age. <laughs> yeah. Any other uh, book recommendations? Um, you know, that, that was actually a fascinating book. So I would definitely read that. You know, the other one I'm reading right now is called The Old Boy and the Man. And it is, a, uh, is about a gentleman reflecting on his relationship with his grandfather and learning some of the skills of the great outdoors. Do you have any favorite spots that you're going to go as soon as, you know, shelter in place is lifted and all this stuff that you're going to going to run to, whether it's a place to eat or a place to hang out or anything like that? Yeah, I cannot tell you how excited I am to eat indoors in, you know, any restaurant at all. Um, the, the town that I live in outside of Atlanta has got a quaint little downtown area. I have a favorite Mexican place that makes the best burrito bowl I've ever had. They do not have outdoor seating and I'm, I'm not comfortable going inside to eat yet. And so uh, when they lift all of this, um, I'm going to starve myself for a day and I might get two of them. If you weren't in IT, in consulting, what do you think you'd be doing? Well, that's great. And you know, it's, um, it's hard to imagine in any career other than this because I've been in it so long and I love it. But um, 
You know, the, the other t- area that I think is absolutely fascinating, and I, I probably would have pursued this had I not got the technology bug, is I'm really intrigued by um, all things associated with intellectual property law and just sort of like watching how organizations have to deal with, you know, kind of intellectual property in an era where, you know, intellectual property is, is just is booming, right? And it's everywhere. I've had the opportunity to, you know, kind of work with some attorneys around it. I, I think it's fascinating. It's probably not the most thrilling thing in the world, but uh, I found it really interesting. And I, I probably would have planted my flag there and, and kind of and grown and developed in that arena. That's a good one. That is, that is pretty fascinating. As soon as I had my first uh, like startup 101, here's how IP works sort of a thing, I was like, this stuff is way over my head. <laughs> that is for sure. But it's super cool, right? Yeah. Okay. So normally we say best advice for first time CIO, but we don't have a lot of deputy CEOs on here. So what would be your best advice for a first time exec in consulting? So it's a great question, Ian. There's no level you reach in this profession where learning and development becomes optional, right? And look, I've, I've been in Deloitte for 25 years. I've been consulting my entire career. And I still learn something every day from my clients and my peers. And you've got to maintain that learning mindset every day of your professional career as you know, any level of executive because um, your ability to be credible, uh, to, to influence the behavior of those around you, and to lead people with authenticity in my view, is directly correlated to your willingness um, and humility to learn. And so that, that, to me, would be the advice I'd leave any executive. And, you know, it's probably one of the most unique aspects of the profession I've chosen. And, uh, you know, it's been one of the reasons I've stuck with it. What question do you never get asked that you wish you were asked more often? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, Ian, in this profession, there's not a question you don't hear. <laughs> um, so I, I, I've had some doozies thrown at me. I, I don't know that I have a question I wish I would be asked. Um, you know, I, I, think I've, I think I might have heard them all at this point. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe when, uh, when are you going to get that burrito bowl? That's for sure. Yeah, listen, that would be a question we're all asking, is it? Rich, thanks so much for joining. It's been awesome having you on. Uh, any final thoughts? Anything to plug? No, listen, I think for your listeners out there, in many ways, this is the uh, next golden age of IT. And while it's challenging and we're all, you know, obviously worried about and thinking about our health and our loved ones, which is most important, you know, I would clearly encourage everybody, don't let the crisis overshadow the opportunity and really, you know, seize this moment. Uh, It's a great time to be in IT. It's a great time to be an IT leader. And um, I think our brightest days in the IT universe are ahead of us. Couldn't agree more. Thanks so much for joining. Appreciate it. And we'll talk soon. Thanks for having me, Ian. Take care. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform.